um, today. I believe God will give you some wisdom that uh, that you've been seeking and that you've been asking him for. That he'll speak specifically to you so that we know how to speak specifically uh, to those who um, God gives us the opportunity um, uh, to speak with. Uh, when we speak, uh, it, it ought to be salt and it ought to be light. Uh, and uh, that takes a tremendous amount of, of work and dedication on, on our part that, that you and I would be so connected to the Lord and in, in, in the house and the word and in the closet of prayer that he can trust us with these conversations. So um, I believe that uh, those things that are going to get shared this morning will be very helpful to you and clarifying um, and uh, will move us in a prophetic sense uh, in, in today's world. You know, there's, there's history in this prophecy. And, and history, you know, just has to do with that which we can grasp that's going on around us, that which we can understand and recount. But prophecy has everything to do with that that God grasps and, and that God recounts and that God reveals. And Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, everything that God wants us to know about the past, the present, and the future, and how he wants us to understand those things are found in Jesus Christ. And you and I have to have that confidence that, that God has all of the whole world in his hands and there's, there's not a renegade molecule in the universe. Um, and he knows what's going on, that he uh, is in control. Uh, and when it comes to your life in the, in the micro and when it comes to the universe in the macro, God has everything under control and it's all under control in the name of the son, Jesus Christ, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what we need to celebrate. That's what we need to keep our eyes on. And when we do, then he gives us understanding for the day. And that's my prayer for you and for me, understanding for today. Uh, uh, Jesus says sufficient for the day is this, is, is this trouble. There's enough today for us to, uh, to, to handle. And if he gives us today our daily bread, then we'll be just fine. Uh, tomorrow will come and we'll be ready. Um, so today, uh, let's pay attention. The Lord is speaking. And uh, so let's pray. And then Jackie's going to get us started off with some worship. Uh, Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you for uh, the ears of your people. They are, we have placed our ears to your mouth. Incline and speak to us. Uh, uh, speak to us um, according to the spirit. Speak to us and uh, in, in uh, Father, revive our, our confidence and our faith once again. We believe. Um, help us in every place um, where there's unbelief. Uh, we are with you, dear God. Help us in the places today where we feel weak and, 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 uh, and, and help us in the places, Father God, uh, where we need to be shored up um, because each and every one of us uh, need our faith strengthened today. And uh, thank you for uh, helping us to, to, to take our eyes off of ourselves and off of the world around us and put them on your son. The Holy Spirit speak, uh, make the things of God, the things of the word of God real to us this morning as we gather together to worship you, um, to fellowship with one another and then share the love of God with one another, but mostly to give you the glory, to give you the attention, to give you all that you truly deserve and you deserve it all. So thank you for this opportunity to meet with my beloveds in Jesus name, amen. Amen, beloveds, go ahead and give God a shout. Jackie, go ahead and get us kicked off. I'm ready to worship. Hey, everybody, it's Pastor Ian Jackie one more time. Here to give God the praise he deserves with a new song. Come on, lift your hands, lift your voices, tap your feet, and dance before the Lord. He is worthy. Come on, church. Let all the people say. And you give me life, life abundant 
is a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a
shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord yeah we sing all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, let's pray together. Uh, Father, thank you. Um, here we are. Uh, we are intent, uh, purposed this morning to receive your word. Uh, we have looked forward to this moment. And uh, so commune with us. And uh, you've called us to the table. Here we are in our seats, uh, ready to eat everything that you serve us. Uh, and you serve us the bread of life, and the bread of life is Jesus Christ. Here we are to take in everything of your wisdom and of your guidance. Uh, so feel free, Father, to share your heart with us, and we will take what you share with us and share it with everyone who will receive. Uh, thank you for making us ministers uh, of reconciliation, um, messengers of the good news who is Jesus Christ. We thank you for these things in his sweet name and by the power of the spirit. Amen and amen, amen. Yeah, special thanks to, to Jackie and, and Aaron and Mimi uh, for worship this morning. Uh, I think it's, it's put us in the right place uh, to receive the word of God. Um, the title of this morning's message is Why Are You Last? Uh, and uh, as I read the passage, as we read the passage together, I think you'll understand uh, the title and the message that God is sharing with us this morning. Uh, we're going to be reading together and speaking from 2 Samuel 19, verses 9 uh, through 12. Uh, and it says this in the word of God. Now, all the people were in a dispute throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, the king saved us from the hand of our enemies. He delivered us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. But Absalom, who was anointed, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? So King David sent to Zadok and Abiathar the priest, saying, speak to the elders of Judah, saying, why are you the last to bring the king back to his house, since the words of all Israel have come to the king, to his very house? You are my brethren. You are my bone and my flesh. Why are you the last 
to bring back the king. Father, let there be a blessing on, on the reading of your word, uh, the hearing of your word, the receiving of your word, the understanding of your word, but more than anything, the doing of your word. In Jesus' name, I ask, amen. Beloveds, I, I often ask myself, you know, why does it take Christians so long to do what obviously seems, obviously needs to be done? Why is, does it take us sometimes so long to recognize what's going on around us, so long to repent for what's going on around us, so long to turn from our sins? Has, has it ever taken you longer than it ought to have for you to turn from your sins. Um, I think I'm in the right, I think I'm in the right church today. I think I'm in the right crowd. I'm gonna grab my phone here. I think I'm in the right crowd that, that, that it, has, it has taken me longer than I'd like to admit sometimes to come to the truth about a situation uh, when it ought not to have, because if I have the Holy Spirit and I have an ongoing relationship with the Lord, and, and my relationship with Lord is, is sincere and it is honest and it is, once again, it is a spirit, it is a, is a spiritual relationship, then it, it, I ought to come to the point where I immediately agree with God when he reveals something to me. But I must admit that that is not always so. So if you're one of those people who um, every time you hear the Lord, uh, immediately you do what you heard, immediately you do what you're commanded, then you probably need to just, you know, you can leave the meeting now because I'm not talking to you. <laughs> but if if there's ever some places where you have felt, that, where you can honestly say that I've been a little slower to come along uh, in something the Lord has shown me for, for, for whatever the reasons, I've been a little slower to come along than I ought to have, then, then, then you're the one I'm talking to. Um, why are you the last? Why are sometimes as Christians, we're the last when, when to, 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 to get things right, to do things right, to change things, to be on the right side or God's side of things? Why are we sometimes last? And this is the question David was asking, because if you remember the story, um, uh, David's son Absalom had rebelled against him and he had won over uh, the, the, the people of Israel and the people of Judah and turned them against his father. And, uh, and uh, he ended up chasing David out of Jerusalem, away from his home. David had to dwell in the wilderness for some time. And um, the, those that went with David were able to muster up an army to fight the, the armies of Israel, who were now following his son, his rebellious son, Absalom. And David defeated Absalom. Uh, and, but it was some time um, after all that uh, before he was actually welcomed back to his own home. Uh, the other tribes of Israel uh, came to their senses more quickly than his own brothers. And it seems that the first people that should have been those to receive him uh, uh, back to his rightful place were the last people. And as I said, far too often as Christians, I find we find that the first people that ought to turn back from the way that they've gone. The first people that ought to hear the word of the Lord, the first people that ought to repent, the first people that ought to come to God on his terms ought to be those of us who call ourselves the children of God. But it is not always so. So why does it take us so long to, to recognize our sins and repent, uh, to see the light, uh, to admit that we've walked away from the Lord and fallen short, far short of his ways, and his will. And, 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 and why do we ignore the cries of our neighbors and, and our brothers while claiming to be the righteous people of God? Remember, the scripture says that, that, that we are to love the Lord with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our souls and our neighbors as ourselves. And when Jesus was asked, okay, all right, well, then who's my neighbor? And uh, he, he, that's where he told the story of what we call the Good Samaritan. And, and notice that he was speaking to, to Jews, but he used a Samaritan as a picture of God's righteousness. And that, that threw some of them right there because some of them were, uh, left the conversation right then and there because Jews had no dealings with Samaritans and Samaritans had no dealings with Jews in, in, in those days. So when Jesus talked about what righteousness looked like and he used the example of a Samaritan um, uh, showing kindness to a Jew, uh, he turned everything upside down, or should I say right side up, 
for their understanding. But it was hard for them to receive that because Jesus was not speaking to them in the terms that they expected or the terms that they wanted. And Jesus was showing them something of the Lord that was beyond their understanding. And perhaps one of the reasons it takes us so long to come along sometimes is because Jesus is showing us something beyond ourselves. Jesus is showing uh, you to yourself, not the you that you have fashioned, the you that you have seen, but the you that he sees. Uh, he's showing you and me standards, not standards as we have measured them, and uh, but standards as he measures them. And his righteousness is higher than mine. His ways, his thoughts are higher than yours and mine. And the question is, is, is my heart soft enough? Are my ears open enough? Am I willing to allow the Lord to bring me to the, to the place where he would have me to be? Even though, even though in my mind, I don't quite agree. Um, look, we have to be honest and say, sometimes we don't agree with the Lord. Um, I, I know that's hard to say, but there are times when we clearly don't. There, there are things that God has spoken to us that are very difficult for us at times, and it takes us a while to come around to God's point of view. Thank God he's patient. As a matter of fact, I, I, think, it's, I think it's very, very um, telling of you and me uh, in a good way when we feel very differently about some things that are important to us. We feel di very differently today than we did two or three years ago. I believe there's some things that I hold on to right now uh, as staunchly as believing it is, the, it is right and it is good that two or three years from now, I realize that perhaps I needed to change. And perhaps God was bringing me to some thoughts and bringing me to some understanding that's beyond what I thought was important, what I thought was right and righteous. God has not finished with you. So the more pliable you are, uh, the more open you and I are to hear God and to allow him to bring us forward, okay, then the, 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 the more we are likely to not be last. Because my question to you, my question to myself this morning is why am I last to do the things that I should do first? So why do we ignore the cries of our brothers and sisters and our neighbors? Why do we ignore, ignore the cries of the stranger and the immigrant? Why do we ignore the cries of the widow and the poor? Uh, why do we ignore the cries of of, of, of minorities? Why do, we, why do we ignore the cry of our brothers who are right next to us and, and crying out for justice? And, 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 and why, why do we do that? And, 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 and we ought not to do it. Why are we last? Just like Israel was last, just Judah was last to bring back their king. So often we are last to enthrone our king and to receive his guidance and his leadership. So why are we last? Beloved, let's not be last. Let's be first. Um, Judah was, was David's immediate family, and you are God's immediate family. And, and, and as I said, you, we might think that, that they would be the first to welcome him back, but they also were the ones who had enthroned Absalom. So one of the things that kept Judah from being able to come back to, to, to God's righteous standard is they had involved themselves in Absalom's rebellion. And uh, there are times, beloveds, where God is bringing us back from some of the things that we have involved ourselves in. Uh, let me remind you that as a child of God, you exclusively belong to the Lord. And the Lord is always, always speaking to your heart and winning you back to, to the exclusivity to the intimacy that is yours in Jesus Christ. Just as I have an exclusive relationship when it comes to the things of, of oneness and intimacy with my wife, we have, we are the bride of Jesus Christ as a church. And we have a, 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 we have made a covenant and we said yes to the Lord. And he welcomed us according to the blood that was shed on Calvary. And, and that cleansed us from our sins. He's welcomed us into the family of God. He's welcomed us to the table. He's welcomed us into the church and he's welcomed us into relationship. And that relationship is the primary feature of our lives. The primary feature of our lives is not that we're Americans or that we're Africans or that we're Europeans or that we're South Americans. Or the primary feature of the life of a child of God is that we belong to the family of God. Now we're a blessing to our nation because, because we're in the family of God. 
And we're a blessing to the world, not because we're worldly, but because we're heavenly. And, and it has been said that, that some people are so heavenly minded that they're earthly good, but I don't believe you're any earthly good until you are heavenly minded. And heavenly mindedness means that we have uh, taken hold of the relationship that God has made available to us in Jesus Christ. And that has become the primary feature of our lives. Now, God gave the children of Israel a king. Uh, they requested a king. And the first king they got was not the king that they thought they were requesting. But the second king they got, David, was a man after God's own heart. And anything God gives you, beloved, you and I have to realize that the enemy is going to try to take that thing from us. So right from the very, very time that God made David, a man after his own heart, made him king of Israel, the enemy was fiercely determined to turn the people of God against him. And, and the enemy succeeded in using David's own son and turning the nation against him. And so that is the heart. I, I admit that is not an easy thing to turn from, to repent from. And there's some things in your life and my life that have been pretty difficult. And it's not easy for us to turn back to God. But beloveds, what is the alternative? The alternative is to continue on in darkness. The alternative is to continue on in a way that, that, that leads to a place that we, we do not want to arrive. We want to arrive at the feet of Jesus Christ because that is the most high place. So God is calling us back even when we were complicit in the things that, that went down that were wrong. Even, even though that Judah was fully complicit and fully to blame, fully to blame for Absalom, uh, the success that Absalom had when he rebelled against David, it was time for them now to turn back and come back to God in repentance, to come back and to humbly receive their king. There are places in, in my life that, and the places in the church that we need to turn back and humbly receive our king because we've turned ourselves, uh, so many that, that call on the name of Christ have, have really turned themselves over to the forces of the world the forces of politics, the leadership of, of, of the world. Uh, and, and while we're called to pray for our leaders, while we're called to pray for them, we're called to be followers of Jesus Christ. And where there's a divergence, we're called to follow Christ, not in rebellion and not in any contempt or dishonor or disrespect, but out of worship, out of a heart of, of devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the ones who are called to pray. We're the ones that are called to repentance. I don't believe that we are primarily called to protest. I, I believe we are primarily called to conquest. Uh, and we are to come to God. And, and what our protest looks different than everyone else's protest. Our protest looks like repentance. Our protest looks like going to God and taking the sins of this nation, the sins of the church, and saying to Lord, Lord, I, I am responsible. Uh, my people and I have sinned. And the scripture says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. You see, that is a totally different response to the things that we see that are going on, that are wrong, that need to be changed. And, and if we're going to be a part of the change that God is bringing, then our role in these things are different than the world's role. Our methodology, our tools, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. They are spiritual. And we go to the closet of prayer. I do not blame people for expressing themselves the way that they do because they use the, they use the weapons that, that, that they deem are, are effective. But we have a completely different set of weapons. We have a different, different coat of armor and our armor is Jesus Christ. So beloved, put on Christ, put on the helmet of your salvation, uh, the, the reality of your relationship with God. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. The righteousness in which you walk will guard your heart and guard your heart because out of it flows all the issues of life. Put, uh, gird your loins with the truth. And I don't mean things that are, that, that are, are true, things that are, I mean things that are the truth. I mean things that are eternal, things that God has spoken. Gird your loins with that. Strengthen yourself with that. Gird up with that and put on the, the, the shoes of peace, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everywhere you go, the good news is preached because you were there and you were a picture of what the good news looks like. Uh, pick up the shield of faith that you can put out all these fiery attacks of the enemy because the enemy is coming to attack you and to take away your peace. But put up the shield of faith. You believe that the Lord has 
everything firmly in his hands. And as I said earlier, there's not a renegade molecule in the universe. Not one. The Lord knows everything. He sees everything. He knows what was. He knows what is. He knows what's coming. And he knows which way is up. He is the only one who does. So we hold tightly to him. We put up the shield of faith to knock down all the fiery attacks, all of those thoughts and all of those temptations that would get you and I off the center. And Jesus Christ is the center. He's the center of the church. He's the center of my heart. He's the center of your household. He's the center of your faith. And he must remain so. And we pick up the sword of the spirit, the word of God. The word of God corrects us, rebukes us, encourages us, strengthens us, moves us forward, tells us once again, which way is up, tells us the way that is right and righteous. And the degree to which we hold on to the word of God, the degree to which we commit ourselves to the word of God daily, to not only reading it, not only declaring it, but doing it, that is the, the degree to which we will not be the last, but we will be the first to hear and to do according to the spirit. So think for a moment of any place in your life where you have been slower uh, to respond, slower to ask forgiveness, uh, slower to, to, to go to the person that you need to go to, slower uh, to pay that debt, slower to forgive that sin, uh, uh, slower uh, to, to make that phone call than you should have been. Why are we often the last to bring back the king. And I'm not speaking of David right now, but I'm speaking of Jesus. Why are we so often the last to sit him on the throne of our activity, on the throne of our ministries, on the throne of our church, on the throne of our thoughts? And why do we find ourselves so compromised with so many other voices that are clearly not the voice of the Lord? So, David said, you are my brothers. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then are you the last to bring back the king? I can hear Jesus say those words to us, to his church. You know, I died for you. I gave my life for you. I won you. I wooed you. And I brought you to myself. I cleansed you. I healed you. I gave you everything that you could possibly need for life and for godliness. So why are you the last to put me on the throne of your heart? Now, why are you worried today? And, and why are you upset? I, I, if, you're, if you've been upset, uh, then, then I totally understand. <laughs> I totally understand that I'm, that I'm not saying anything, to, to, uh, anything negative or anything to blame because there is a lot uh, going on around us, uh, which is unsettling. Um, uh, yet, yet, um, I defy you to be unsettled if Jesus Christ is on the throne of your heart. Uh, the fact that I'm unsettled uh, is proof that Jesus Christ is not on the throne. So why am I last to bring Jesus to mind? Why is it the last thing that I do is to reach for my Bible? Why is it the last thing that I do is, is to pray? when it should be the first thing, it should be the priority. And if I did pray and if I did worship as a priority, I would not be worried. I defy you to be worried when prayer and worship is your priority because Jesus washes all that away. And the scripture immediately uh, comes to mind, be anxious for nothing, my sister. Eric, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request to God and he'll give you the peace that you don't even understand. He'll give you peace. You go like, well, what happened? What happened to all of that worry? What happened to that? Well, God has given you a peace beyond anything that you can even grasp because he's God. But you have given him your attention and you have given him the throne of your heart. Uh, I wrote a song years ago. It says, you know, God has put him on the throne up in heaven. Have you put him on the throne? of your heart. Why are we last to put Jesus on the throne? You know, it, it, we used to say um, you would get to a point where something was, was, was pretty difficult or something I had gotten to the point beyond uh, where we could do anything about it. And, and, and the thought would be, okay, well, I guess all we can do now is pray. Have you ever said that? All we can do now is pray. Um, and and I, 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 once again, I'm not, I'm not speaking of that in a negative, in a negative form, but there's something better than that. Uh, perhaps we should have been praying all along. 
perhaps prayer should not be a last resort. Uh, perhaps prayer should be our first, should be our life. Paul, as a matter of fact, says, pray without ceasing. So prayer is more than a priority because priorities can change. Prayer is to be our reality, not our priority, but our reality. In other words, Paul also said, he said, for me to live is Christ. If I'm alive, it's got to be all about Jesus. Jesus is my life. There is no other life. I don't have one. So for me to be alive, he, in him, we live and move and have our being. And there's no me without Christ. And I pray, I don't just pray. It's not something I do or something I get around to. My life is a prayer. I'm praying when I don't even know that I'm praying. I've learned to pray without ceasing. I've learned to let my life be an offering to God. And that's what it means to put Jesus on the throne. And my question again is why is that the last thing that we find ourselves doing when it ought to be first? So you, you and I are living in tremendous times of stress. And, 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 and the question is, is how is the church of Jesus Christ you and me individually and us corporately, how are we to conduct ourselves in times like these? These are hard times. Uh, I woke up to news this morning that, that, that you woke up to the same news this morning that, that there are, you know, they're just, just that we're a disturbed nation right now. And, and uh, there was a, a gentleman uh, that, that lost his life and there they, are people that lost their lives this week in the midst of these disturbances. Um, and, and, and there's not a much consensus on how to handle these things, how to get to the bottom of them, how to bring peace out of the situation. Let me remind you, first of all, beloved, you are peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus says to, says to us from the Sermon of the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers. We are God's children. If God wants to bring peace to a situation, he sends you. That's what it means to be a peacemaker. So when you know that God wants to bring peace and love and light and kindness and joy and happiness and resolve and reconciliation to a situation because he sends you. He does not send you and me to take a side or to be a part of what's already going on. That was going on before you got there. If God sends you there. He wants something that to happen that can only happen through those in whom he resides. And if he lives on the throne of your heart, then when you step into a situation, peace, 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 the peace of God enters into that situation with you. You are God's peace. God is not going to give the world peace apart from his church, okay? You are the light of the Lord. Jesus said you are the light of the world. The scripture says Jesus is the light of the world and Jesus says you are the light of the world. In other words, the light in you is Jesus. So if Jesus is going to arrive and he's going to bring peace and he's going to bring reconciliation, he's going to do it through his church. Now, the church can't do two things at once. We can't serve two masters. We cannot be. We cannot be bound up to any side of any argument and also be standing on the solid rock who is Jesus Christ. He is not on my side. He is not on your side. He is the righteousness of God. I'm going to give you a quick picture of that. Remember when Joshua stood before uh, the troops and, and God was certainly with Joshua. Joshua was God's leader. He was God's man. He told Joshua, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And he did miraculous things through Joshua. So the people feared and respected Joshua just like they did Moses. So there was no question Joshua was God's man. Uh, and then he, but he was surveying his troops and he saw a man standing off and the man had a sword, sword drawn. He was, and, and he had not ordered his soldiers to draw their swords. Swords are only drawn when it's time to do battle. But this was before the battle. So he walked over to the man. And he says to him, are you with us or are you for us? And the man said to him, no, as a captain of the armies of the Lord, that's why I am here. What it was, was God himself and the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ standing before Joshua, reminding him that Joshua was on his side. He was not on Joshua's side. Israel was on God's side. God was not on Israel's side. You are on God's side. You are with God. He is not on your side. He's not on my side. God does not think I'm right about anything. 
The question is not if I'm right about anything. The question is, am I righteous in everything? And the only one who's righteous in everything is God. So perhaps uh, we need to understand that we cannot take partisan sides of any worldly argument and be right with God because God is not on your side. As a captain of the armies of the Lord, I've come. I'm going to finish because my computer is starting to, uh, uh, to, to, to leak out on me here. Um, the Lord is the, the Lord has called you for his purposes. Let us not be the last to recognize that. Okay, let us be the first to recognize that and remove ourselves from the arguments and the fray of the day and to connect ourselves with the will and the ways of God in fasting and in prayer, seeking his face, turning from our wickedness, as the scripture says, as I quoted earlier, so that God will hear our prayers and he will move on our behalf and he will heal our land. Do you realize that America needs a healing that only Jesus can bring? That we cannot heal the, the, the things of the past and the things that have gotten us to the day that we are today. We cannot do it. We can't do it through our protests. We can't do it through voting. We can't do it through, through any of those things that, are, that is a methodology that's effective in worldly things. But God has called you and I to a spiritual understanding. Yes, do what you need to do as a, as a citizen of this nation and fully participate and do all of that in the light of who Jesus Christ is, knowing that he is the only answer if we are going to live in peace and in safety and security. And I pray that for all of you, that, that in your heart, that peace and safety and security starts in your heart because you have been the first to bring Jesus Christ back to the place of preeminence in your life that he deserves. Let us not be the last to put Jesus on the throne and to set every other God aside, to put every other leader in their place. We are following the shepherd. We are sheep of the shepherd. So let's set aside anger. Let's set aside our politics. Let's set aside judgments of other people. As you notice that when we get to judging, it's always other people that are wrong. That's, that's one way that we know we're being judgmental because we're not wrong, they're wrong. And God would correct us on that because God is not holding us accountable for anybody else's wrong. He's gonna hold us accountable for ours. That's what we need to be. Why do we, by the way, try to, to remove the sliver out of our brother's eye and we have a log in ours? And so we cannot come to God from, or come to any situation as Christians from any standpoint of righteousness. God alone is righteous. So let's lay aside those things and present our hearts to God and ask, uh, ask him to show us the way, to give us his heart. Let's not follow the voices of the world. Let's follow the voice of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they will not follow another. That's how we know the people of God. They follow the voice of Jesus Christ and they refuse to follow any other voice. Let us not fool ourselves and think that there's any man that will lead us who is not leading us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that any man will lead us well and will lead us to places of satisfaction, the places that only Jesus can lead us. The Bible says that he will lead us to still pastures. He'll lead us beside still waters, to green pastures. He'll, he'll restore our souls. He'll lead us in paths of righteousness. That's how you recognize godly leadership. It leads us in peaceful paths. And even through the valley of the shadow of death, we have no fear for that leader, Jesus Christ, is with us. And so let us follow those who are following Christ. Paul's what Paul said to his leaders, to, to, said to, his, to, to his sheep. Follow me as I follow Jesus. And I can say this to you. Follow me as I follow Jesus. The moment I stop following Jesus, then you are right to stop following me. But as a shepherd, I work for the capital S shepherd. And as I do, it is my calling to lead you in paths of righteousness. And that's what I'm speaking to you today. Let us not be the last to get on the path that is the path that Jesus is leading us on. Let's not get around to God after everything has fallen apart and say, oh, I guess all we can do now is pray. Let me put that to you a different way. 
all we need to do, all we should do today, and what we should do first, and what we should do consistently, is pray. That is the only way. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey, as the old song says. So let me finish with this. I, I'm praying that I would not be so callous and so stubborn and so slow to turn from my sins and turn back to Jesus. And I, I, I want to make this personal. I want to be sure that I am not the last, that the last thing that I do, but the first thing that I do is to turn back to Jesus Christ in any way, in any way, which is illuminated to me, which is revealed to me by the Holy Spirit. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to speak to every heart, everyone that's listening to me today, and make it clear what specifically he's saying to us. And that in you and your life would not be so callous and so stubborn and so slow to turn away, to, 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 to turn away from your sins and to turn back to Jesus. But it would be the immediate thing that you do. It would be the right now thing that you do. And I'm praying that I would not hearken back to yesterday and um, or, or but but to move forward toward the will of the Father, and that I would turn away from any and everything that harms my neighbor, and that I would seek justice, and I would seek peace for every man and every woman, and treat my neighbor and the stranger the same way I want to be treated. To treat your children the same way that I want my children to be treated. You know, I told the Lord many years ago, that I wanted to behave myself around women in a certain way. And I wanted to behave myself around women so well that I could actually pray to him, Lord, may my wife and my mother and my daughter and my granddaughter and my nieces be treated the same way that I have treated every other woman. And that's where it becomes personal. This is personal, beloved. As I'm speaking to you, you and I need to conduct ourselves in such a way that is exemplary of the Lord's heart for others. The Bible says love does no harm to its neighbor. So anytime our neighbors are crying out, the church has to be the first to hear and the first to respond and the first to repent and can never be complicit with voices and actions that harm another person. We can never do that. No sense of justice or self-righteousness or, or, or any stance on any issue will ever justify us doing anything other than treating our neighbor, blessing our neighbor and loving them like we love ourselves. And you might say, well, those people are my enemy. But what, what, what does Jesus say? He says, love your enemies. Love them. Do good to those who spitefully use you. See, Jesus' standard is higher than mine, as I said earlier. And I need to be the first to get on my knees and put Jesus on the throne, and not the last. The church must be first to get on its face before Jesus Christ. And so I'm not going to follow voices and movements that spread hate or fear. For Jesus is neither hateful, He's not a dishonest, he's not disrespectful, he's not, dis, he's not corrupt or any such thing. Jesus is pure in all of his dealings and he's called you to be the same, a reflection of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because he is the one who sits on the throne of your heart, the throne of every conversation. So I will not be the last to repent. I will not be the last to bring back the king. I will not be the last to come to Jesus. As a matter of fact, my prayer is come, Lord Jesus. Come right now. You know, there's a, a Greek word um, that's translated, come Lord Jesus, and it's Maranatha. Go ahead and say that with me, say Maranatha. Uh, as you pray this week, just pray that word. Just pray that word. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and sit on the throne of my worship. Sit on the throne of my attention. Sit on the throne of my heart. Come, Lord Jesus. 
um, sit uh, uh, in, in the place of righteousness uh, in my dealings when it comes to things in my community and my nations and, and, and when it comes to my dealings with my neighbor. Lord, Lord, sit uh, on the throne of, of, of all of my meditation. Sit on the throne of, of my relationships and my family and my church. Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, come. Uh, let us not be the last to invite Jesus to come. Amen, beloveds. Amen. You can go ahead and unmute and there's an amen. Go ahead and shout it out. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hey, y'all. I love you all. Um, uh, here, here's my, my last instruction to you. Okay. Uh, my last instruction to you uh, before you go. Uh, this week, um, open up the scriptures uh, and, and find yourself uh, prioritizing um, that, making that first. Okay. Uh, this is a time where you need more good news than world news. Um, and trust me, the world news will be there when you get back to it. Um, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that any, it helps us to be ignorant of what's going on around us, not at all. But uh, the question is, is what are we filled with? Uh, be filled with the word of God. Be filled with the knowledge of his word. Jesus Christ is the word of God. Be filled with the spirit. Um, and the Lord is looking to you and to me. He's looking for who he can trust uh, in order to uh, uh, help people get their eyes on Jesus and make sure the king is brought back to his rightful place in the eyes of the church. We are the church. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. Uh, let's do everything we possibly can to keep our eyes on the Lord. And in doing so, uh, we're doing the will of God because people will look to the one when they see us standing and looking up, they're going to look up too. And they're going to look up and see the one that we see when we look up. Amen. Um, I love you all. Bless you. You're going to get, like Jackie said, a, a notification for uh, Wednesday's um, Bible Answer Man. So go ahead and get your questions uh, uh, ready to go and look forward to seeing you. And it'll be six. It'll, by the way, it won't be 630 on Wednesday. It'll be six o'clock uh, Pacific Coast time. Um, and uh, so and we can take as much time as we need. And uh, so go ahead and put your questions together. I'll do my best to answer them according to the word of God. Uh, she'll also be getting you notification for um, the Zoom meetings for the next uh, couple of months. And um, so I look forward to that. And God bless you, beloveds. Um, share this message with as many people as you can. Uh, it'll be posted on our Facebook page. Um, it's also posted on YouTube. Um, so share the message because I believe that uh, those of us who call on the name of Jesus Christ, every now and then we just need to be reminded, let's, let's make sure it's the King, Jesus Christ, sitting on the throne. Let's not be the last to get around to the reality that Jesus Christ is the answer. Amen. So I look forward to seeing you Wednesday night, and if not before, next Sunday. Um, stay safe, uh, be wise, um, and, uh, and, and represent Jesus Christ well, wherever you go. I love you all. And uh, go ahead and unmute and greet each other. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Ah. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. 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 Welcome. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> See you soon, everybody. Okay. Bye. 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 He is the light of the world. Is he?